Hey, let me. Hi, everybody. Nice to see. That's me. Well, I'm the one. I'm the shorter one. I'm the shorter one. That's me. Um, nice to see some of you in a line and nice to be back with CSP again. Shadel, very nice to meet you. Thank you for introducing me. Um, I should say, I should say that I was uh, 24 years old when I graduated from Claremont McKenna College and the day after I graduated, which may have been on Shabbat, um, flew to Madrid and unpacked my bicycle, mi bicicleta, and I rode my bicycle around Spain and Portugal and Italy for the next 10 weeks before I uh, landed in Jerusalem, where I really began officially my studies of uh, Jewish philosophy, Jewish thought. So we're going to be talking about Rambam um, even today, although that's not where we're going to begin. And so the very first thing I need to say about my relationship to Rambam is that I am not an expert on Rambam, because in order to be an expert on Rambam, you need to know Arabic. And I do not know Arabic. So I have not read the Guide of the Perplexed in the language in which it was written. I have read it in several different translations. Um, and nevertheless, even though I am not an expert, I really feel compelled to teach about the Rambam, A, because of his incredible importance at the time and subsequently, but also for today both in terms of what he thought and who he was. And so today's focus is actually going to be not so much on Rambam, but on his milieu, on where Rambam emerged from when he was born in 1138 in Cordoba, in Andalusia, in southern Spain. I want to take a look at that culture. Um, the the Amongst the books that I can recommend that will give you a wonderful insight into Rambam is Moshe Halbertal's book that I'll be referencing and showing you a picture of a little later, and then a book by Micha Goodman, and I'm pretty sure that Micha Goodman has been on CSP um, several times before. I don't know if he's spoken on Rambam, but one of the things that Micha says in his book is that we call him Rambam, we call him Moshe ben Maimon, but his friends called him Musa. His friends called him Musa. Mo Rambam was an Arab Jew. We're not really used to hearing those two words together, and that's all the more reason why I think it's important to talk about Rambam, because he was uh, a, a Jew coming out of an Islamic Arab cultural matrix, and so much of what he contributed to the Jewish world can really only be understood within its Arabic context. All right, so um, you can see toward the bottom of the map, 711, Moors take Cordova. So the Moors were um, Muslims from Morocco, and 711 begins the conquest, the conquista of Spain. They make it all the way up to the Pyrenees, right? Andorra is somewhere up here. Um, and they never quite make it past the Pyrenees and into France for too long anyway, right? They make it in. You can see some of the, um, some of the arrows here. But basically, from 711 to 1492, the... Muslims and different Islamic groups have different sections of the Iberian Peninsula. We talk about the Golden Age of Spain. That is really a product of 19th century German Jewish historiography, more than it is of history. But that was a golden age for some Jews. And perhaps the most famous of the earliest Jews, specifically in Andalusia, was a guy who's got streets all over Israel named Shmuel Hanagid. So he was a poet, he was a military person, he was a political advisor, a vizier in the language of the day. And um, 
this is something that he wrote and this will give you um a little bit of an idea of how invested Jewish Arabs were in the lingua franca of the day for the intelligentsia, and that is poetry. Poetry was much more important in the Middle Ages than it is today, uh, at least in, in my world. Um, and as you will see, the level of homoeroticism in a poem like this speaks to the general environment that Jews were a part of. So this is Shmuel Hanagid. I'd sell my soul for that fawn of a boy, night walker, to sound of the oud and flute playing, who saw the glass in my hand, said, drink the wine from between my lips. And the moon was a yud drawn on the cover of dawn in gold ink. That's it. I love that fawn plucking roses from your garden. You can put the blame on me. But if you once looked at my lover with your eyes, your lovers would be hunting you and you'd be gone. That boy who told me, pass some honey from your hive. I answered, give me some back on your tongue. And he got angry, yelled, shall we too sin against the living God? I answered, let your sin, sweet master, be with me. So this is not what we generally learn in Hebrew school or Sunday school, although I'm working on a change in the curriculum. Just, you know, come, come back to me next year about that. Um, but this really was part of the cultural mix of medieval Judaism in Spain. So you've got names that are familiar, Shlomo Ibn Gabriel, Shlomo Ibn Gavirol, um, Moses Ibn Ezra, Abraham Ibn Ezra. They all wrote poetry. The most famous, right, is Yehuda Halevi. So my PhD is in Jewish thought. And so the conceit um, in my world was, yeah, Yehuda Halevi, he was a Jewish philosopher who wrote some poetry. No, 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 no. He was a Jewish poet who wrote one book of philosophy that, you know, like did really well, the Kuzari, the book on the left. Um, if anybody is interested in reading uh, his biography by Hillel Halkin, it was fantastic. And amongst the things that Hillel Halkin does so well is translate poetry, which, God, that's going to be tough. So um, this is something that Hillel Halkin translated. And he wrote that Yehuda Halevi apparently wrote this on a napkin in a bar, right? This was just the banter in the bar. I'm too young to put down the cup I've only begun to pick up. Two and four, what end should I stop when my years are not yet two and four? Right? The two and the four and the, and the rhyme sequence, right? That was just how they impressed other people at a bar, um, you know, whether it was uh, same gender, cisgender, not, you know, I don't know. Um, but here is another kind of erotic poetry. It's not all religious poetry. Some of the stuff that comes down in our Sidorim and our prayer books is about religious poetry, and that existed as well. But this is Yehuda Halevi. You have enslaved me with your lovely body. You have put me in a kind of prison. Since the day we parted, I have found nothing that is like your beauty. So I comfort myself with a ripe apple. Its fragrance reminds me of the myrrh of your breath, its shape of your breasts, its color of the color that used to rise to your cheeks. That's pretty cool. I think maybe we'd have a better turnout at Sunday school if we started uh, integrating this into the curriculum. Okay. So um, let's talk a little bit about the Reconquista. Uh, so um, Rambam was born in Cordoba. So here is Seville. Here is Granada. And Cordoba is, I can't even see where Cordoba is. My glasses. Granada. Well, it's right around here. I forget where it is, actually. But it's Granada, Sevilla. Cordoba's in the middle. There it is, right there, Cordoba. Um, so we just had elections 
And it turns out that in um, 1148, there were the equivalent of elections, um, which is called war um, in Andalusia. And there had been a relatively enlightened group of Muslims who was in charge of that area of Andalusia and Granada. They were called the Almuvarids, and they were ousted by a group of less tolerant Muslims associated with the Berbers called the Almohads. And you've heard the term Dhimmi, D-H-I-M-M-I, the, the people of the book, people who Muslims um, respected as monotheists and people constrained by religion. And so the previous Muslim occupiers of Spain treated Jews as Dhimmi, as protected people of the book, but the Almohads did not. And there um, was a series of persecutions that eventually led the Maiman family to leave Granada, to leave that area, Cordoba. First, they went to Sevilla, to Seville, and then eventually they dropped down to Morocco. And that was actually where Maimonides got his medical training. In the city of Cordoba, you had an incredible amount of learning. The influences on Moses Maimonides, you could really divide into three different groups. The first had to do with his father. So Maimon, right, Moses, the son of Maimon, Maimon was a community judge, um, a Dayan. He was in Cordoba, so he was the leader of the Jewish community in Cordoba. He had his yeshiva training um, a little farther north in Lucena. Um, from people who were the leaders of Moroccan Jewry, people like the Rif and the Rimigash. You don't need to know those names. That's one kind of learning. The other kind of learning was Aristotle and Aristotelian physics and Aristotelian metaphysics. So over here, you've got a bust of Aristo, of Aristotle, right? We are, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So for those of you who know this rabbinic line, right? Do something even if it's not for its own sake, because eventually you will come to do it for its own sake, right? That kind of habit forming virtue is found both in Aristotle and in the rabbis. In the Middle Ages, there is a book called Sefer Chinuch, a book of education, that says the heart is pulled after the deeds. So if you do the deeds often enough, then your heart will change. It will be pulled. It will be transformed as a result of coming to do those deeds. So rabbinic psychology and Aristotelian psychology were already on the same page. And what Maimonides' project is, is to bring almost the entire remainder of the Aristotelian corpus, both physics and science and theology, metaphysics, into Judaism. And we'll see how he does that. So I said he's got three influences. One is Judaism through his dad. One is Aristotle. And the other one is the Arab translation or the Muslim translation of Aristotle. People like Al-Farabi and Ibn Rushd. So here's Al-Farabi. A just city should favor justice and the just, hate tyranny and injustice, and give them both their just desserts. Right? Al-Farabi was one of the few Muslim philosophers that Maimonides quotes, but his biggest appreciation goes to somebody named Ibn Rushd. His name is Averroes in Latin. Um, this, is the, this is the Muslim Maimonides, also born in, Cord also born in Cordova, right? Just... Um, 10 years or so before Maimonides. 
He opposed dogma, championed Aristotle. And this is really where um, he's related to something that I wrote. I wrote something called the Co Coherent Judaism. So there was a medieval philosopher um, who wrote a book called The Incoherence of Philosophy, right? And what Ibn Rushd did was to write a response to that called The Incoherence of the Incoherence, right? It's not that philosophy is incoherent, it's that your critique of philosophy is incoherent. This is um, something interesting. Those of you, you know, I think probably everybody is familiar with Salman Rushdie. His father took the name Rushd because of Ibn Rushd. So that's how Salman Rushdie got the name. And this could, this quote could equally be by Rambam. Um, and it certainly comes, it will come up and we talk about evil. So ignorance leads to fear, fear leads to hate, and hate leads to violence. This is the equation, right? This should be a bumper sticker for 2022, um, as well as a bumper sticker uh, maybe on your camel uh, for the uh, for the twelfth century. Okay. One of the things that one of the reasons why it's really important for me to teach this material is because in the tenth and eleventh and twelfth centuries, ninety percent of Jews lived in the Islamic orbit. We Ashkenazi Jews live in a country, the United States, where 85% of all Jews in America are Ashkenazi Jews. So we are, right, my daughter introduced me to this term, we are Ashkenazocentric. We are Ashkenazocentric. Understandably so. But a thousand years ago, nine out of ten Jews spoke Arabic, right? They lived in the Islamic orbit. And we don't give that enough attention when we're thinking about the history of the Jewish people. So once the Almohads defeat the Almuvarids, you've got Rambam dropping down to Morocco. Very interesting what happens to him there. Maybe we'll get to that in the next couple of weeks. But eventually the um, Almohads enforce a more stringent form of Islam also where Rambam was living in um, in Morocco, so they moved to the land of Israel with his dad and his brother and his three sisters. Can't make a living in the land of Israel. Old story, Sherelle, maybe you're familiar with that. Not easy, even back in the 12th century. And so Rambam and his family go down to Cairo, a suburb of Cairo called Old Fashtat. And this is where we pick up the story. Okay. So we are now going to take a look at a couple of passages from Rambam's big three books, right? He's born in 1138. So when he's 23 years old, he starts writing a commentary on the Mishnah. Part of why that's amazing is that he's 23 years old. Oh my God. He's like, just at 23 years old, I hadn't, I didn't know what the Mishnah was at 23 years old. And he's writing a commentary on the whole thing. It's the foundation for the Talmud. And up until that moment, it had really only been looked at as the prelude, as the jumping off point to the Talmud. But what Rambam does, he's not the first, he's the second, um, is he looks at the Mishnah as its own literary unit. Okay, let's see what he says in his commentary on the Mishnah. Um, in the Mishnah, Rabbi Akiva says that people who read Svarim Chitzonim, outside books, have no share in Olam Haba. And this is what Maimonides says. The reason why they're considered outside books is because they don't have good stuff in it like science. They're just a waste of time. Now, there's no reason to think that Rabbi Akiva cared all that much about whether or not these outside books had science or not. He was probably more concerned about heretical opinions, but 
Here, we can see how Maimonides is beginning in his 20s, folks, to reread the entire rabbinic tradition and to say that what makes these books worthy of losing your share in the world to come is because they're a waste of time. Not because they say something that's wrong, but they're a waste of time. And what makes something a waste of time? There's no science in them. Now, I want that to start to percolate because what that means is that already in his 20s, Maimonides believed that the only thing that was worth your time was science and that that's how you get the world to come. And if you don't have science, you don't get the world to come. That's radical. That is completely at odds with everything that you, everything every statement in rabbinic literature right can i say every statement i probably shouldn't say every statement i don't know of a single statement in rabbinic literature right in the entire talmud and the entire midrashic corpus that would support that reading and it's going to just get more and more intense so also in his commentary on the mishnah he writes this great little book this great little pamphlet called um, Shemona Parkim, the eight chapters. And it's his, it's his introduction to his commentary on Perkei Avot, right? His introduction to his commentary on Perkei Avot. Perkei Avot, for those of you who might not know, is in the Mishnah. So it's completely reasonable that he's writing a commentary on Perkei Avot because Avot is in the Mishnah. And here he says something, again, in his 20s, that tells you how politically sensitive he is right? Much more so than I am. I will often cite others' writings without identifying them. In some cases, somebody who lacks insight <clears throat> might believe the statement is faulty or wrong simply because the author isn't Jewish. Can you believe such a mentality? They might cast doubt on the validity of a statement just because the author isn't circumcised. And this is what he says. Accept the truth regardless of its source. Accept the truth regardless of its source. And the person who said that was even rushed. Accept the truth regardless of its source. And in this little eight chapters of Maimonides' introduction to a vote, he quotes Aristotle's ethics for about 85% of his points. 85% of his points. But if he starts quoting Aristotle, and if he starts quoting even Rusht, he knows that there are going to be from Yidden who push back because they're from Yidden. And because those particular flavors of pious Jews don't want to be influenced or exposed to outside books. And maybe that's what outside books meant. All right. That's the commentary on the Mishnah. This is a good time to stop. Questions? So, um, so for now, there's uh, one or two questions. If any, if anyone has more, you're welcome to send them in the chat now. Uh, one was about how uh, did the Ramam have access to this knowledge? Like, was it only through his father? Or what was the schooling system like there? Was it like because of affluence and status, or was it a common uh thing yeah so he was rambam was tutored by his father exclusively his father went to yeshiva and had some of the great teachers of the generation but rambam really only studied with rambam only studied jewish material with his father and it wasn't until he went down to morocco that he studied medicine um, and he wrote quite a bit about medicine, um, but it wasn't until he went down to Morocco that he studied medicine with experts. Um, and there is another question there. Uh, how would uh, Rambam define science? What, do, what would he include in that? Great. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, what we would call philosophy used to include science up until the 1870s if somebody studied philosophy natural philosophy 
natural philosophy included the natural sciences. Mm -hmm. um, so for sure, it includes what we would call metaphysics, but it includes what we would call astronomy, biology, physics, optics, zoology. So <clears throat> physics in Greek means that which changes, that which changes, phusis. The metaphysics in the way that Aristotle's books were sequenced, metaphysics came after the physics. So it was meta physics, meta is after. So on the one hand, metaphysics describes the book that talks about the nature of reality and God, the sequence of that book, the placement of that book is after the physics, but metaphysics is also that which doesn't change. Phusis, physics means change, metaphysics means beyond change, right? So it's talking about both conceptually beyond change or after change, beyond change. And um, in terms of the placement, it's beyond the book of the physics. So science included those scientific subjects, as well as what we today would call ontology, epistemology, um, the theory of how we know things and the theory of the way things are. Okay. Hey, okay, I'm trying to keep track of the questions. Um, did Rambam have access? I'll, I'll, I'm going to bunch a few of them, okay? Um, uh, did he have access to Rashi's writing? How long was Ibn Rushd before Rambam? Was his access to these other sources through his father? Now I'm trying to yeah. combine all, the, all his learning uh, uh, question. Um, and... The last one, which is really interesting here, and I'll ask is what- They're the all interesting, Sherelle. They are, but this last one really surprised me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to do this simultaneously. Was he considered heretical at his time? So okay. all of those bunched together were timeline of Rashi and Rushd, and where did he have access to all these learnings? And then the other one about how he was received at the time. Okay, so- he never, ever, ever, not even once quotes Rashi. He doesn't know Rashi, right? Doesn't know Rashi, doesn't know the Tosafot. So Rashi is 1040 to 1105. So Rashi dies, right? Decades before Rambam was born. But that's like Provence. That's like the outskirts. That's the hinterland. That's Yeninvelt. I don't know how to say Yeninvelt in Arabic. But however you say Yeninvelt in Arabic, like from where Maimonides was in the center, in one of the centers of the Islamic world, right? Provence is, you know, like it's it's the redneck outback country. So he didn't know from um, he didn't know from any of the people that become the Ashkenazi giants. He knew about the Geonim in Babylonia, and he knew about the scholars in North Africa. He knew about all, anything that he knew Jewishly, he knew from his dad, right? Okay. Um, Ibn Rushd was born 10 years before Maimonides, and he was born in the same city. So like they're rubbing shoulders. You know, I don't, I have no, I'm sure they didn't meet, right? Because Rambam left when he was so young. But, you know, it's completely reasonable to think that Ibn Rushd met Rambam's dad. You know, like no reason to preclude that possibility. Um, you know, Cordoba's, you know, it's a city, but it's not, you know, it's not Mexico City, right? It's not this huge sprawling metropolis. So, you know, the the intellectual, the the intelligentsia, I'm sure, um, you know, they, they spoke the same language. Everybody's speaking Arabic. So I'm sure that there was some interaction. We don't have any um, smoking gun documents that cite that. Okay. Um, Rambam was, so the, the question, the way you phrased the question, Shadell, was heretical, I think. Is it, did you say heretical or controversial? Yes, I'm, I'm quoting uh, yeah. Ruth Levor, who asked the question. Yeah. And so the, the language is, is heretical? Yeah. No. Uh, was he considered okay. heretical in his time? So 
he was considered controversial in his time for a number of different reasons, um, none of which we've gotten to yet. So um, he was very controversial in his time. Later on in the 1230s, in the 1230s, that was the height of the anti-philosophy polemic in France and Northern Spain. Then he was considered heretical. But right, he dies in um, 1204. So it's not until decades after he's dead that his heretical star rises to prominence. Okay. Um, two more questions before we let you continue. Okay. Uh, one is, when was Aristotle translated to Arabic? Great question. Let me answer that first, okay? Um, it, in large part, it was the Jews who were responsible for these translations, which is really, you know, kind of interesting and, um, and a story unto itself. We were able to trans, we, like I'm part of it. Um, they were able to translate Aristo already in the ninth and 10th centuries, everything except his politics. So his, the, the politics is actually Plato's Republic and Plato's politics. And that's why you get this idea of the philosopher king, which is Platonic, not Aristotelian, but that's very much part of Rombaum's vision. And um, the other thing that comes down as the theology of Aristotle turns out to be Plotinus and Porphyry and these guys who are part of the Neoplatonic school. But the, the answer to the question is that almost everything that Aristotle wrote, except the politics, and some stuff that Aristotle didn't write that was called Aristotelian, was available by the 10th century. Okay. Um, last question for now. Uh, I'm reading Lisa's question. Why are there stories that Rambam's family were forced to convert to Islam when they were in Morocco? Because they did. Oh. Rambam converted to Islam. Rambam was a good practicing davening Muslim. Five, right? He had to go from three times a day to five times a day. Oh my God, what sacrifices he made. So when things got rough in Morocco, um, <clears throat> his family was told, convert or die. So when you're told, convert or die, according to Rambam, according to Rambam's letter to Yemen, if it's to Islam, you convert. Because Islam is every bit as monotheistic as Judaism, right? There's no, there's no, there's no grave Torah transgression that you're making, but what you need to do is leave that place where you have to live as a Muslim as soon as is practicable. And that's what he did. That's why he went to the land of Israel. So how do we know all this? Because when Rambam is back in Cairo, as the doctor to Saladin, as the doctor to, you know, Egyptian royalty, somebody in the court sees Rambam and says, yo, Musa, we used to daubin together at the mosque. What are you doing as a Jew? And so the cat's out of the bag. At that point, it is a capital offense to convert from Islam to anything else, a capital offense. And so Rambam is put up on charges that if he's found guilty of having converted from Islam, he's going to be executed, capital crime. So he is now testifying and he said, it is true that I was a practicing Muslim in Morocco for however many years, but I was forced to convert to Islam in order to save my life. And so the, the judge said, if you were forced to convert to Islam, that is not a sincere conversion. Therefore, your status as a Muslim was never completely authentic. Therefore, you didn't revert from Islam to Judaism when you came to, um, when you came to Cairo. You just reverted to Judaism because you were allowed to, having never authentically um, 
and sincerely accepted Islam and Muhammad as the last greatest prophet. So that's how he was able to not be executed for having left uh, Islam. Fascinating story. Okay, moving forward. The Mishneh Torah. So the Mishneh Torah means the second Torah. And in Rambam's introduction to the Mishneh Torah, the second Torah, Shnayim, right? Shnayim means two. He says, if you have the written Torah and you have this book, the second Torah, those are all the Jewish books you need on your bookshelf. You don't need the Talmud. You don't need the Midrash. You just need the Tanakh, the written Torah, and the Mishneh Torah, and you're good to go. And what are you good to go do? You're good to go learn Aristotle's physics and metaphysics. Rambam was not known as a terribly humble person, right? In this code, he includes things that haven't been operative for a thousand years, like the sacrifices. He includes things that have never been operative, like the laws of messianic days. He includes things that are relevant in the land of Israel when Jews have sovereignty in the land of Israel. And he includes things that um, are prevalent, are that are relevant and um, important to know right now. It took him years to write this. About 1170 is when it was, you know, published, when it went out to the public. And what he does is he organizes 613 mitzvot into 14 different categories. It is a brand new categorization, and it has never been repeated. So when people talk about the great codes of Judaism, the Mishneh Torah is one of those codes, but the other codes share a structure that is not how Rambam structured the Mishneh Torah. So the Shulchan Aruch is one of those other great codes in Judaism. It has four parts, not 14 parts. At the beginning of the Mishneh Torah is what we would call theology and science. Never again has a code, a halakhic code, included philosophy and science. Because generally, since the rabbinic period, the attitude has been, believe what you want to believe, but keep kosher. Believe what you want to believe, but give tzedakah. Believe what you want to believe, but keep Shabbos. Rambam is the only jurist, right? The only legalist who prefaced, like who wrote a book, what's it called? Laws of the Foundation of the Torah. Okay, Laws of the Foundation of the Torah, where he's going through philosophy and theology and science as to say, in order to be a from Yid, in order to be a kosher Jew, in order to observe the mitzvot, the way the mitzvot need to be observed, this is what you need to believe about God. Never happened again. Never happened before. So <clears throat> I think if I were to ask people, you know, give me a mitzvah, one of the mitzvahs would be the vahakta, right? You should love the Lord your God. So here is how Rambam in the very beginning of his code, describes what it means or what's involved in loving God. It's a mitzvah to love and fear, right? Love and awe, love and fear, same for fear and awe, same words. This glorious and awesome God, as it states, vahavta et Adonai Elohecha. How do you do it? What's the path to love and fear? Here it is. When a person contemplates God's wondrous and great deeds and creations and appreciates God's infinite wisdom that surpasses all comparison, that person will immediately love, praise, and glorify 
yearning with tremendous tremendous desire to know God's great name, as David stated, my soul thirsts for the Lord, for the living God. That's love. And when he ponders these matters, he will recoil with fright. That's fear. And realize that he is an insignificant little ant. Lowly and obscure, endowed with slight and slender intelligence, standing in the presence of him who is perfect in knowledge. We thought, because Rashi told us so, that to love God meant to do the meets vote lovingly. We thought that to love God meant that we needed to do something. Right? My sister, my brother says, um, I'm going to show you I love you by doing the dishes and by doing the floor. That's not what Rambam says. Rambam says that loving God is all about contemplating, appreciating. You're contemplating God's deeds and creations, but it's not your deeds and creations. It's God's. And fear isn't fear of punishment. It's the fear and the awe of realizing how itsy bitsy teensy weensy we are in the grand scheme of things. To put this in other language, for Rambam, what it means to love God is to study philosophy. Try selling that in Maya Sharim. See how far you get. Try going into an ultra-Orthodox yeshiva and telling them that they're loving God all wrong. That Rambam says you need to be studying medicine and physics and genetics and climate science because that's what Rambam says. And that's part of what makes Rambam, are you sitting down? That's part of what makes Rambam the biggest loser in the history of Jewish thought. As important as Rambam is, as much as people like me want to lift up the Rambam, he failed miserably at some of the most important things on his agenda, one of which was to get Jews out of the Torah of Moses and Moses and into the Torah of the world, right? Looking at the world as a place to understand God's wondrous and great deeds. There are a few people who have taken Rambam's advice some of whom even continue to identify as Jewish, and some of whom even continue to go to shul on more than Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, but those are the minority. Laws of tshuva. One loves God only with the mind. And to know, no, know, know God is to love, love, love God. Your love is in accordance with your knowledge, whether it's a little bit or whether it's a lot. You only love God to the degree that you know God, and you only know God to the extent that you understand how God's wisdom manifests in creation, period. That's Rambam. These two quotes are from Moshe Halbertal. If you're going to read one book, it's a big book. But if you're going to read one book on the Rambam, this is the book, Moshe Halbertal. This linkage between knowledge and the commandment to love God sheds light on an unusual feature of Mishneh Torah. Science's role is the means through which one attains the pinnacle of religious experience, the joining of love and awe. Philosophy, which included science, thus becomes a person's highest religious obligation. If there's nothing else that you get out of today's session, it's that. That philosophy for, for Rambam is a person's highest religious mitzvah.
so not what I think is intuitive about Rombo. Okay, I'm going to take questions here because the next bit, yeah, the next bit is um, a parable that we're going to have to read kind of slowly and is going to take the rest of the time. So questions now. Sherelle, you are muted. Thank you. I will say that all questions about sources and quotes will be sent in the follow-up email so that we're not spending time uh, on that. I have here two questions about Spinoza. One is, I don't know how to say Spinoza in English, by the way. Spinoza. Oh, okay. So one is, what was Spinoza's opinion of Maimonides? And the other one was, uh, how do the ideas of Rambam differ from Spinoza in regards to science? Okay, so um, Spinoza read Maimonides in Latin, right? Spinoza didn't know Arabic, um, and his Hebrew, from what we know, his Hebrew wouldn't have been good enough to read the guide in um, in Hebrew. <clears throat> um, he quotes Maimonides. He has a positive attitude toward Maimonides. Um, they're different. Okay, so Spinoza understands God to be in extension. So we think about Spinoza as a pantheist, somebody who is God intoxicated, someone who sees God everywhere. Maimonides sees God's wisdom everywhere, but you can't see God. You can't see anything that is godly. The only thing that would be godly for Maimonides would be a reflection of God's wisdom. So if you think about the Aristotelian distinction between form and matter, Spinoza understands that God is both form and matter. Maimonides understands that God is form but not matter. If you don't understand that, that's fine. Maybe the person who asked the question about Spinoza will. And if not, I can later on point you to different readings. Okay, that's it. Sherelle, we're moving on. There are more questions. Um, I'll maybe ask one of them. And if it's not for now, we'll keep it for next session. Uh, there's a question here. Did he reject ritual? Not at all. Okay. <laughs> so... What's a little counterintuitive is that Rambam is a pretty conservative halachist. Pretty conservative halachist. Didn't reject ritual. Law. He wrote a code on ritual. And he's very, very mock -beat. He's very strict about ritual. Okay. Here we go. This is the end of the Guide of the Perplexed. Not the very end, but toward the very end. First, he's going to give you a... Um, an analogy, and then the analog. So, so now's the parable. It's a very common parable. A king is in his palace, and all his subjects are partly in the country and partly abroad. Of the ones in the country, some have their backs turned away from the king's palace, their faces in the other direction. But some are desirous and zealous to go to the palace, seeking to inquire in his temple and to minister before him, but have not yet seen even the face of the wall of the house. Of those that desire to go to the palace, some reach it and go around about in search of the entrance gate. Others have passed through the gate and walk about in the antechamber. And others have succeeded in entering into the inner part of the palace and being in the same room with the king in the royal palace. But even the latter, even the ones in the same room, don't immediately upon entering the palace see the king or speak to him. For after having entered the inner part of the palace, another effort is required before they can stand before the king at a distance or close by, hear his words or speak to him. Okay. That's the parable. 
Now he's going to unpack it. And I was so nice as to put the different rings of human beings in different colors. Okay. So on the first page, it's just red. I will now explain the parable which I've made. The people who are abroad are all those people who have no religion. Notice how he defines religion. Neither one based on speculation nor one received by tradition. So speculation is philosophy, mind, intellect, tradition, Torah. And then he's going to give you some examples of those people from his day. I consider these kinds of people to be irrational. They're not human beings. Because for Rambam, to be a human being is to be rational. And when you have to kill one of these people, which you do sometimes for Rambam, you're not really killing a human being because they haven't manifest the divine image in themselves because the divine image is rationality and they have forsaken rationality. They're below humanity, above monkeys, but below humanity since they have the form and shape of man and a mental faculty above that of a monkey. Next. Those who are in the country but have their backs turned away from the king's palace. They're people who have religion, belief and thought, but not everything that they believe is true, either because they adopted it because of some great mistake they made on their own, or because they received a tradition from others who made their mistakes earlier and they were misled. Because of these doctrines, they, these people recede more and more from the royal palace, the more they seem to proceed. These, they're even worse than the people in red. And under certain circumstances, you know, it's going to be necessary to kill them and to rip out their doctrines in order that others should not be misled. It's also pronounced misled, but misled sounds so much better to me. Okay, that's blue. Moving on to green. Those who desire to arrive at the palace and enter it, but have never yet seen it, they haven't seen the palace. That's Amcha. That's the mass of religious people, the multitude that observe the mitzvot, the multitude that observe the mitzvot, but they're ignorant, right? They do the right things. They desire to arrive at the palace. They have good intentions, but they've never even seen it. There's a better group within that group. They arrive at the palace. But they go around about it. And those who devote, th who are they? They devote themselves exclusively to Talmud, to the study of practical law. They're reading the Mishnah Torah, but they're not reading anything else. Those people have arrived at the palace, but they haven't gotten into the palace. They believe traditionally in, in true principles of faith right? Because it's in the Mishnah Torah. And they learn practical worship, all the rituals of God, because it's in the Mishnah Torah. But they're not trained in philosophical treatment of the principles of the law. They don't know what's behind the law. They don't endeavor to establish the truth of their faith by proof. They know what they should believe, and they know what they believe, but they don't know why they believe it, because they haven't studied Aristotle. Now we get to the highest level. Those who undertake to investigate the principles of religion, they've come into the antechamber. They've gotten in the palace. And there's no doubt that even these can also be divided into different grades. But those who have succeeded in finding a proof for everything that can be proved, those who have a true knowledge of God so far as true knowledge can be attained, and there's a limit. 
They're near the truth whenever an approach to the truth is possible. They have reached the goal and they're in the palace in which the king lives. My friends, my question, is there a necessary relationship between purple and scarlet? Do you have to be in the purple group to be in the scarlet group? Because the people in the scarlet group don't have to be Jewish. They can be Al-Farabi. They can be Ibn Rushd. They can be Aristotle, right? They have undertaken to investigate the principles of religion, the philosophy, and they have found a proof. The people in the, the Holy of Holies aren't necessarily Jewish. And this in contrast to Dante, where Aristotle is right there, the unbaptized and the virtuous pagans, the first circle of hell. So for Christianity, Aristotle is burn, baby, burn. But for the more enlightened, universalist Jewish Arabs, like Maimonides, you don't need to be Jewish to be at the highest level of proximity to God. To have the greatest connection to God is not a function of ritual or of action. It's a function of knowledge and philosophy. So for those of you who um, are surprised that this is Maimonides, the joke is there's Maimonides and your Maimonides. Um, this is not the Maimonides who is taught in yeshiva, because this is from the Guide of the Perplexed. This is the Maimonides who is taught in medieval philosophy classes at the university. And it's available in some yeshiva b'tei midrash libraries, but not all. And so what we're going to be doing over the course of the next three weeks is to see how this kind of ideology unfolds in terms of specific laws and approaches to the law that we don't normally look at very deeply. Okay, so that's, it's 201 Yasher Koach Shai. <laughs> Thank you, Rav Shai. I will say there are a lot of comments in the chat relating to this hierarchy of human being based on knowledge, uh, uh, some finding it quite offensive, other wondering uh, about its relationship to Darwinism. So I'm saying that so that maybe next week we can address some of these uh, uh, issues. Thank you so, so much for this uh, amazing first session. Uh, as a lot of people were asking, you'll receive a recording of this session with follow-up notes so that you can uh, kind of bring yourself up to speed for our next session uh, on Tuesday, November 22nd. That's next week. So thank you very, very much. And thank you, everyone. Bye-bye, Bye -bye, everybody. Bye. Have a good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, wherever you are. Goodbye. Bye.